a few minutes, uh, Justin Neufeld, who teaches philosophy uh, here at CMU, including courses like Philosophy of Science, will introduce uh, our guest speaker and resident science, uh, Dr. Henry Jansen. But before that, I'm just going to tell you a couple things about uh, the start of this, this whole week. There's a certain sense that I think we hold at CMU that good science and sound theology not only belong in conversation, but actually need each other so that both can be practiced well. And it is out of that understanding, that commitment, that good science and sound theology need each other, that the whole notion of this week began. And. Uh, it, it began with um, a conversation with Richard Penner, who, who we're thrilled is here this evening, and what tweaked his interest was some reflections from a CMU student in a blazer uh, on one of her science courses here, and through that, um, Richard became intrigued in what would be possible between science and theology here at CMU. And uh, with a conversation with him, he said, hey, I'd be willing to support the stand behind it and make sure that we can ha that can happen. So I'd like to introduce to you, uh, Richard, please stand up and uh, allow us to thank you for, for your role here with us. So thanks to Richard Penner, and now please Justin, who will introduce to us uh, Dr. Henry Jansen for this evening. Well, good evening, friends. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, my name is Justin Newfeld, and I do teach philosophy here at CMU. And tonight it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Henry Jansen. Uh, but before I begin those introductions, I want to say something about the format for uh, our evening tonight. Uh, Dr. Jansen's talk will be about an hour, and then there will be time for questions afterwards. Uh, so I encourage you to keep that in mind, uh, and we welcome all sorts of questions, questions of confusion, clarification, concern, um, affirmation, dispute. Um, it's part of the substance of the evening, and, uh, uh, and we want to work towards that at the end. On to the introductions. As many of you know, an online introduction to Dr. Jansen will inform you that he is a research scientist in soil biochemistry at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Research Centre in Lethbridge, Alberta. He studies how farming and other human practices affect prairie ecosystems with emphasis on the carbon and nitrogen flows within them. And this work has led to his participation on reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the leading international body for the assessment of climate change. In recent years, his interests have expanded to include other socio-ecological issues, such as growing more food, preserving biodiversity, conserving soils, and using energy wisely. However, this kind of introduction hardly does justice. It's been a delight to have Henry with us. He has been open, accessible, passionate, and himself. He has helped us to think about important and complicated matters, and he has sought our help on these same matters. And all the while, he has framed these conversations in a spirit of joyful truth-seeking. It will come as no surprise to hear that the relationship between science and faith is a complicated one. And yet, this complication has been eased in recent years in a surprising, although perhaps unwelcome way. Whereas for a long time, science was the good guy and faith was the bad guy, nowadays both science and faith are held by many to be the bad guys. It has long been a critique of Christianity that it despises this world for the next, that its otherworldly concerns distract from this worldly issues. Moreover, when it does turn its gaze from heaven to earth, it does so weaponized with fantasies of dominion and human exceptionality. What's newer is that this same critique has come to be directed at science. Scientific reason is disembodied and abstract, we are told. It is allergic to what cannot be measured, dissected, and weighed. It scoffs at indigenous cultures and perspectives, and it is incapable of seeing the natural world as anything other than raw material to be manipulated for human purposes. Francis Bacon famously said this, for just as a man's disposition 
is never well known or proved till he be crossed, so nature exhibits herself more clearly under the trials and vexations of science than when left to herself. Well, we are vexed, these critics say. The climate crisis that is underway is the offspring of the troubled marriage of science and faith. No longer do they have the luxury of pointing the finger at each other. Yesterday, Henry's chapel talk presented a very different picture of the unity of science and faith. Whereas these critics see science and faith as unified and alienating humans from the world, Henry argued that science and faith together are capable of drawing us toward the earth, each other, and God in loving attunement. Speaking of science and faith both, Henry urged us to see difficult questions as God's persistent grace. These questions are not a peril, but a treasure to be savored. His hope was that we would be blessed with noble questions, vexing and relentless questions that will fill us with a boundless passion and call us homeward. Speaking of his own life, Henry told us that he has discovered that in his seeking, he has been sought. In his pursuits, he has been pursued. In being lost, he has been found. At the opening of this chapel talk, Henry said this about himself. I am what I always have been, a shy farm boy from Coaldale, Alberta. This reminded me of how G.K. Chesterton opens one of his books. There he shares that someday he wishes to write the story of a boy whose farm or cottage stands on the flank of a hill. The boy went on his travels to find something, such as the effigy and grave of some giant. And when he was far enough from home, he looked back and saw that his own farm and garden, kitchen garden, shining flat on the hillside, were but parts of some such gigantic figure on which he had always lived, but which was too large and too close to be seen. The main problem we face, Chesterton writes, is how we contrive to be at once astonished at the world and yet at home in it. Already Henry has helped us to think about this problem, and I trust that this is not an inappropriate way to introduce his talk tonight on carbon flows through life and times. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Henry Jansen. I'm afraid I can't offer much lofty rhetoric this evening. The best I can do is offer some musings from below as a student of the soil. Or in language more prosaic, a student of dirt. I adore that word. I adore that word. It's so humble, so quaint, so unassuming, belying, hiding the, the vitality of the soil, the role of the soil as a hub in the torrent of energy that flows through all of our ecosystems, sustaining them all and us within them. And the source of the energy, of course, is the sun, as Burroughs puts it, which beams upon, which beams down from the fructifying heavens. All the things that we see that are moving are moving because the sun is shining. It's solar energy that moves the rabbit, the deer, the whale, the boy on a bicycle outside my window, my pencil as I write these words. The very thought just now congealing in your mind is propelled by photons from the sun. Isley says, the human brain, so frail, so perishable, so full of inexhaustible dreams and hungers, burns by the power of the leaf, which has trapped and pulled down the energy of the sun. And of course, the carrier of that energy is carbon. It's the carbon atoms that flit from sky to earth and back to sky again, ceaselessly shutting, shuttling the sun's energy to all living things. The light from the sun is invested by plants and carbon-rich sugars, by photosynthesis, some of which we and our fellow creatures burn back to CO2, thereby releasing the flaming heat of the sun. But most of it ends up in the soil as autumn leaf, as dying root, as other organic debris 
there to be dispensed and dispersed by the mysterious menagerie that occupies the darkness of the soil, who release it back again to CO2 by decay for another flight around that circle. Carbon flows thus form a long continuum. What has been will be again. There is nothing new under the sun. And that carbon continuum, of course, connects all living things, including us. Just as an illustration, allow me a simple thought adventure. Take a breath and mark that breath in your mind. And now, expel it. In that single exhalation, you have just released a great swarm, a great cloud of CO2 molecules. And before this night is done, they will have diffused throughout this cavernous room and will start seeping outside, eventually to circulate around the entire planet. And if you wait a while, if you wait a year or so, says Tyler Folk, you can go anywhere on the planet and pick a root and uh, pick a leaf, and in that leaf will be one or several atoms from that single exhalation. That's an astonishing, initially unbelievable to me, but I think he's right. An astonishing and humbling metaphor of the connectedness of us all in these flows of carbon. And of course, those carbon atoms continue in their wanderings from leaf, maybe, to worm, from worm to robin, eventually to some tropical tree, ending up in the banana in your local Safeway. And so they flow, endlessly, ceaselessly, and thereby connecting us not only over distances of space, but also over time from hidden, forgotten past to the farthest future still unseen, from Julius Caesar through our time eventually to the time of the children of your children's children. And that then finally, at long last, leads me to the title of these musings, Following Carbon Flows Through Life and Times. And I want to very briefly try to address Two things. First of all, to contemplate the flows of carbon atoms and especially the human influence upon them. And then using that as a backdrop to explore some questions that arise from such contemplations. Questions which I think will unfold a range of disciplines. Science, yes, but also ethics and maybe faith. And ultimately, I trust, maybe also of hope. But let me emphasize and doubly emphasize at the outset that I don't, I do not stand here as an expert. I'm not an expert. In fact, one of ecologist has said that you should be aware, you should be aware of experts because too often they are people who know an extravagant amount about precious little. George P. Marsh, who wrote a treatise on the subject many years ago, had this to say. He said, it is my aim to stimulate, not to satisfy curiosity. And it is no part of my object to save my readers the labor of observation or of thought. That is also my humble motive this evening. It's not to enlighten you, but to, but to elicit. It's not to expound or explain, but primarily to adduce from you your higher thoughts for a collective conversation. Let me begin then with a very quick overview of what we call the global carbon cycle, which looks a little bit like this, with a massive pool of carbon in the air, some 800 billion tons of carbon, it's a pentagram, a billion tons. That exists as CO2. A roughly equivalent amount exists in plants and animals. That's mostly trees. 
which, like all other living things, are roughly 50% carbon on a dry weight basis, and then a much larger amount that exists in the soil, primarily as humus, which gives the surface soil its darkening hue. The more carbon it contains, the darker the soil, and generally the more fertile it will be. And all of these pools are connected by various flows and fluxes that we've talked about. And the ocean, too, is exchanging carbon with the air. And so as a result of all of these fluxes and their feedbacks and interactions, these systems have been fairly stable for a long, long time until we came along and started messing with some of these flows a little bit with our growing numbers, our expanding demands, our burgeoning power and propensity to rearrange the biospheric furniture. We began by cutting down trees and burning them, by plowing the lands, releasing some of that soil humus. All of these shrunk the pools of carbon, the amounts of carbon stored in the biosphere, releasing it upwards as CO2, and that's still ongoing to some extent by process of deforestation, for example. But that's no longer our biggest influence. There's another one you're well aware that's a little more ominous. Like all life forms, we search out great pools of carbon to perpetuate ourselves. And of course, in searching out pools of carbon, we're searching for those pools of solar energy. It's the solar energy we're after. As Boltzmann, famous scientist, said many years ago, talking about photosynthesis, he said, we have no idea how it works, but the products of this chemical kitchen constitute the object of struggle of the animal world. And nothing in nature compares in fierceness to our own competition for that solar energy. And in the end, or at least for now, we've emerged as victors in that competition for solar energy. But we won or have excelled by cheating. In effect, we've gone outside that current carbon cycle. We've burrowed down deep into the past and uncovered their fossil carbon. In effect, fossilized sunshine. That is sunshine trapped in carbon eons ago by photosynthesis then, and existing now in oil and gas and coal. And we are burning back that fossilized sunshine at ever higher rates, now pushing up toward roughly almost 10 billion tons of carbon per year. That's more than a ton of carbon released per person every year for every person on the planet. And sadly, I suspect my contribution is considerably higher than that global average. So what we've done is shifted our dependency from the current sunlight to fossil sunlight, that old sunlight. Most of our energy now is from that fossil sunlight. And it has become the primary fuel for life on the planet. And to this fossil sunlight, we owe our prosperity. It has brought us many good things. It is so concentrated, so convenient, yes, yeah, so cheap. Three spoonfuls of crude oil contain about the same amount of energy as eight hours of human manual labor. So when you turn the key on your automobile, you are marshalling, managing an energy amount roughly equivalent to that of a thousand solar-driven human slaves. Caesar Augustus himself could not muster that amount of energy so conveniently with a simple turn of a key. And this fossil carbon is invested throughout our lives in so many hidden ways, in our homes, our toys, our endless gadgetries, and yes, in our food as well. 
Let me give you one quick example. About 100 years ago, an austere, bespectacled man stood before an august audience, maybe a little bit like this. And he said, he intoned, we have a problem. We stand in deadly peril of not having enough to eat. The problem is we're running out of what he called fixed nitrogen. That is the nitrogen available for crops to grow and, and flourish. But he said, the chemist will have to come to the rescue. And the chemist did come to the rescue. They managed to find a way very shortly thereafter of synthesizing ammonia. That is nitrogen available for plants to be used as fertilizer. They pulled it out of the air by industrial processes. And some have argued that this is among the most important inventions ever. More important than the light bulb, more important than the airplane. And who's to argue? Because almost half of us now are nourished by that process of industrial nitrogen fixation. If you're an average person on this planet, almost half of the nitrogen in your body today came from a fertilizer plant. And that discovery, of course, is possible only by exploiting fossil fuels because it's very energy intensive. So to sunlight we owe our prosperity, maybe even our lives, our food. Abundant oil has been the wellspring of our wealth. The material and scientific greatness said Saudi a century ago of our day is due to the primitive accumulation of the solar energy of the forest of the Carboniferous era. But there is a downside. In ecology, there is almost always a downside. Because we're all connected. Everything's tied together. We can never do one thing. Nature is not deliberately benevolent. Usually when she offers us a gift, she demands some recompense. Any organism, any society for that matter, is constrained within its habitat not only by what it can extract, but also what it can excrete into its environment without fouling its habitat. If the output of waste exceeds the capacity of that system to absorb and recycle those wastes, we run into trouble. So we have with CO2. In the last decade or so, emissions of fossil fuel-derived carbon into CO2 has been somewhere upwards of 8 billion tons of carbon. That's the average over that decade. Some of that is absorbed by the biosphere, on land and at sea, but only about half. So every year, there are another 4 billion tons of carbon added to the atmospheric stock. And that is the origin of this famous graph that we've all seen countless times, the increasing CO2 concentration in the air. And that increase is happening quite quickly, very quickly, on geologic time frames. When I was a student back in the 70s, it was 330 ppm. Just now, just now it's pushing through 400 ppm with consequences that may be a little unsettling. What are those consequences? Well, one that we don't always think about is the effect on ocean chemistry. As the ocean absorbs some of this excess CO2, it becomes measurable, it's becoming measurably more acidic. But the one that is prominent, foremost often in our minds, is the question, what happens now to climate? Now, the physics of the natural greenhouse effect are pretty well understood. Essentially, CO2 and other greenhouse gases are transparent to incoming radiation from the sun, but they absorb the outbound radiation, so the temperature of the atmosphere rises. And that is a very good thing. Without its natural greenhouse effect, the Earth would be 
a cold and barren place. It would be Winnipeg in January. So the natural greenhouse effect is a blessing to us. But what happens now when the concentration of these gases climb higher? Well, calculations from long ago, as well as the best models today, say there will be warming. But unfortunately, scientists cannot say with any certainty what the rate of warning, warming might be. They can't predict exactly. The world is far more complex than our models can ever capture. For example, how do you predict the flightiness of clouds which reflect some of the incoming sun? And predicting rainfall or other weather events is even more problematic. So because of this vast complexity, we are condemned to uncertainty, or as the more honest among us would call it, to ignorance. And simply studying it longer likely will not help that much. Generally, in complex systems like this, the longer you study, the more you learn, the more you stumble upon all those things you never thought of before, which complicate the matters. Human ignorance is not an entirely solvable problem. So where does that leave us? Where do we go from here in this uncertainty? We do know the atmosphere is changing. But now the unsettling questions. What happens if we keep doing what we are doing? Dare we blithely assume no unpleasant consequences? And it gets even more complicated. The questions get even more thorny when we admit that the consequences of our response, one way or the other, will be borne not by us, but by those far afield from us in space and in time because we're all connected through our carbon flows. So because of questions like this, many are saying we will need to find a way to live again inside the biosphere, inside that current carbon cycle. To live again on current flows of solar energy, not the accumulated sunshine of Paleolithic summers. Can we find alternative energy sources? And a range of them have been offered, many of them already in progress and already in use. Especially attractive are those we would call renewable sources, all driven by the sun. Because of course it is the sun that turns the atmosphere and makes the windmills turn. It's the sun that lifts the water up against the pull of gravity. It's the sun we burn in ethanol and so on. So this move toward renewable fuel, of course, is laudable, critical, essential. It will, it's, it's necessary to happen. The difficulty is that such transitions typically take time, not months or years, but often decades. And so far, our progress has not been exactly heroic. And meanwhile, energy demands are rising. And quickly, perhaps as much as doubling in the next 50 years or so. Largely in part because those in the developing countries look at us and say, we want to live like you do. And so the corollary question, can we use energy also more frugally, thereby hastening the transition? The most important way to speed up the transition, says Vaclav Smil, who is a very prominent energy thinker based right here in Winnipeg, says the most important way is to lower overall energy use. But I invite you to think even broader, even more widely, 
taking a wider view and thinking also about preserving and augmenting the carbon already stored by planting trees or not count, cutting them down, by preserving, maintaining, maybe even enhancing the carbon stored in soils, thereby holding the carbon in the biosphere within the soil and plant community rather than allowing it to escape as CO2. And secondly, by using more wisely the incoming solar energy, that solar energy that is being trapped by the power of the leaf. And this is important, not only for ourselves, but for all the other creaturely neighbors we have who need it as much as we do. Maintaining biodiversity is a matter of preserving and setting aside energy for their use as well. And so that now broadens our perspective. It's no longer just a matter of thinking about preventing climate change. Now it becomes a matter of living well within the carbon flows. And that enfolds so many other challenges. Food and energy and biodiversity and nutrients. And yes, social harmony. What is it, after all, that we often quarrel about, to put it nicely? Most or all of these issues are tied into the flows of carbon, which means the flows of solar energy. All are interwoven. None can be resolved alone. The hungry person is not likely to worry much about shrinking habitats for polar bears. Living well within the carbon flows means looking after land. And by land, I mean the ecosystem. And I don't mean just some beflowered meadow and some alpine ecosystem. I mean the land you see outside your window. And maybe even I mean the ecosystem on this side of the window, because of course we're all enfolded in these carbon flows. We all live on the land wherever we may reside, because they're all connected and we're all connected into the land, into the ecosystem. Well, I think by now you've seen where I'm heading and the point I've been driving toward. Simply to say that to resolve our troubles, science is only part of the picture. Although improved technology is so important, it may not be enough on its own says Sorlin, our belief that science alone could deliver us from the quagmire has long ago expired. Science alone will not rescue us. We need also changes in human behavior. Technological change alone will not be enough. And that now leads us to thinking about an altered mindset. We have trod the face of the moon, touched the nethermost part of the pit of the sea, but for all that, it's not so much our technology, but what we believe that will determine our fate, says Flannery. And Smeal said a few years ago, can we finally start thinking about what too many people believe to be unthinkable? That what we're facing here is an ethical challenge and a moral dilemma. Science alone will not save us. And I think that's an uplifting thought. That's a liberating thought. Because now the healing of the earth can spread outward from the land of our doorsteps. Now the onus is on us to ask, what do we do? What can we do as community? How do we live in a way that is fair to all our neighbors, connected by flows of carbon over space and over time? And let me say right now, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. But I will offer some timid, what I will call inklings, just some timid inklings hoping to stimulate your thoughts. And I offer these in the lovely words of Alfred North Whitehead, as an ignorant man thinking. Now where do we start? Maybe the place to start. And it's something we sometimes overlook, I think. But maybe the fundamental starting point is to rekindle a sense of wonder. 
the sheer delight in being alive in a beautiful, mysterious, bountiful world. Maybe before fixing and restoring and renewing and adjusting, maybe we need first just to pause and to listen and to see, really to see. The question is not what you look at, but how you look and whether you see, said Thoreau. Some crystalline day in Winnipeg winter, of which you have so many, go stand beneath a majestic elm and look up into the branches, the twigs, the twiglets, and see the exquisite fractal symmetry. In effect, the trees reaching for the sun, knowing that in warming rays of April sun. Those buds are ready there already to unfurl their numberless leaves, absorbing again the CO2, some of which you have just now breathed out, resuming the miraculous cycles flowing around and through you. Or ponder this. 2,000 years ago, stood a rough-hewn beam, a rough-hewn wooden beam upon a darkening hill. Its carbon atoms, long ago, released by fire or decay. Where are they now, those carbon atoms? And how many swirl among us still? And what imagery bursts forth from thoughts like these? What metaphors? What sense of wonderment? We will not perish for want of information, but for lack of a will to wonder. Because from wonder springs many wholesome attributes. Said an old agronomist many years ago, admiring a field of hay or a shapely head of cabbage is a great force for good. Because from wonder springs gratitude. What if I had never seen this before? What if I knew I would never see it again? And reverence. Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush of fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes, the rest sit round it and pluck blackberries. And from wonder sprouts stewardship, born of love. About 60 years ago, some of the leading thinkers and scholars of the day convened in Princeton, New Jersey to discuss and worry about the growing human role in changing the face of the earth. They talked about the growing stresses. They fretted about spiraling population, about dwindling land and food and energy reserves. They worried about fouling air and polluting water, about shrinking biodiversity. The litany of troubles that afflict us still today. And in the end, the scientists will do. They produce this mass of tome, bursting with facts and findings and figures. But in the end, on page 1152, these are the closing words. Not power, but power directed by love into the forms of beauty and truth is what we need. Only when love takes the lead will the earth and life on earth be safe again. And not until then. The primary motive will be affection, said the evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould. We cannot win this battle without forging an emotional bond. For we will not fight to save what we do not love. But that's a bit of a problem. 
because we've become disconnected. Suffering a crucial, profound estrangement from our habitat. Can we find our way to Eden if we don't know the fragrance of lilac? I've never heard a metal arc, never seen a potato sprout. What are we missing? Our eyes glued and addicted to electrons dancing in ubiquitous video screens. If it were possible, said Bailey, for every person to own a tree, the results would be immeasurable. Well, if not a tree, maybe a short row of car carrots in some urban lot. And if not carrots, maybe a jubilant geranium on some sunny windowsill, reminding us of the carbon atom swirling through and all among us and the wonder erupting all about us. That's my first inkling, leading to the second, and that is to follow the carbon atoms over distances of space, seeing all the connections all things by immortal power, hiddenly to each other linked are. You cannot stir a flower without troubling a star. The effort to secure a decent future must be built on the awareness of the connections that bind us to each other, to all life and all life to come. And now we're face to face with that age-old question. And who is my neighbor? For every atom belonging to me, as good as belongs to you. Said Mumford 60 years ago, we are now at a point where over 2 billion people have become neighbors, and we shall have to learn all over again what the love of neighbor means. Well, the neighborhood's a little bit more crowded now. And the connections that bind us are growing ever more tangled. The CO2 from my Oldsmobile ends up in someone's yam. And that laptop I'm thinking of buying maybe is rolling off some assembly line of a coal-fired factory right now. And if I buy that laptop, that's my CO2 coming out of its stacks. Neighborless, neighborliness now is international. And that poses some interesting ethical questions. Because my share of carbon flow far exceeds that of my neighbors. Because energy access and energy use is deeply uneven. Someone has calculated that the poorest 3 billion people in the world emit 5%, account for 5% of emissions. And who suffers the most? Who is likely to suffer the most from a changing environment? It may, be well, may well be those bottom three billion people because environmental changes typically weigh most heavily on the poor who cannot buy their way out of trouble. And the poverty-ridden people pass their suffering to the soil, thus keeping alive that cycle of degradation. The carbon atoms remind us there is no greater solidarity than to see ourselves as riders on the earth together. Our gravest dangers, suggests James Lovelock, is not climate change itself, but the quarrels and frictions among us, we the most powerful creatures on the planet, the most capricious, the most vindictive, driven often enough by the growing demands on a full and finite and fickle planet. Who are my neighbors with whom I share the carbon flows? And how do I love them better? A third inkling based on the previous one, and that is to follow the carbon atoms also over time. To be aware of the neighbors still unborn. Those waiting some decades hence from now, the ones we will never see, the ones waiting for the cascade of consequences of what we do this day. 
The ones who will one day inhale our air, scratch a living from the soil we leave behind, marvel at whatever beauty we have left untarnished. The ecological thinker is haunted by time. When I began my career way too long ago, I was given to look after these old plots, these old relic plots that were established at Lethbridge in 1911 and are ongoing still. I admit I found them a little plain, a little dull, hardly the kind of innovative glitzy instrument a brash young scientist might use to assault the frontiers of science. But as they and I have aged together, and as my own ignorance has grown, I've come to treasure those old plots because they have something that's priceless. Yes, they're primitive. Yes, they're flawed. But they offer the wisdom of time etched into its memories. Those plots of land remember the grinding glaciers. They remember the grazing bison. They know last year's planting. They remember distant events connected by the carbon flows. We can go back and analyze those soils. And we have analyzed those soils and find in them the signals the isotopic signatures of the atomic bomb tests that happened when I was a little boy. The land remembers such things. That's what we do as students of soil. We probe those memories, hoping to hear in the echoes of the past the first murmurings, the first stirrings of the days and years still to come hoping to learn what it means to be good stewards, hoping to learn what it means to become good ancestors. For time is relentless. We come and go, but the land stays, the air stays, the soil stays, the vegetative and creaturely communities stay. The land stays and it remembers. The land remembers the lengthening past and one day, it will be you and I that are remembered. And departing, we leave behind us footprints on the sands of time, footprints that perhaps another seeing shall take heart again, Longfellow. We all leave footprints. None of us is excused. We leave footprints. They are our gravest worry, perhaps, and also, I think, among our bravest hopes. And that leads me to the fourth inkling. And that is to be hopeful. Our hope, or hope is one of our duties. But how do you have hope in such a world? Certainly, I can tell you and assure you that there is a dearth of hope in science often. The gloom and doom niche in conservation is well occupied, the hope niche is still pretty wide open. Oh, star-eyed science, hast thou wandered there to waft us home the message of despair? But even in science, we're starting to see that fear and threat-based tactics, the drumbeat of dire warnings, the debates based in terms of danger and loss are no longer eliciting the responses that we might have hoped for. And so even in science, I see that word sprouting up more and more. The world needs hope. We must remain hopeful, recreate renewed hope, struggling to find hope, wellsprings of hope. Hope is vital. But now we have to ask, what do we mean by hope? What is hope in this case? And I'm inclined to think, it's not just the prospect of future flight to some disconnected ethereal realm. I like the way Vaclav Havel puts it. He says, hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the, not the sense that everything is going swimmingly, but rather it's an ability to work for something because it is good. It's the ability to be engaged in something that counts, something that matters, something that outlives us and outlasts us. 
It's not easy. Despair demands so much less of us. It's so much more predictable. In a sad way, it's safer. But hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up, says David Orr. Where do we begin? Let me propose an old word, maybe a little outmoded. Let me suggest a starting place to be a repentance. You know, it's so easy to find others to blame. It's those soulless multinationals who keep on manufacturing the manifold trinkets that we cannot refuse to buy. It's those spineless politicians who refuse to enact the kind of legislation that would see us evict them from office. Or it's those shameless scientists jetting off to exotic locales to ponder global warming. There's blame enough to go around. But we're all embedded. We're all embedded in the carbon flows. Says Wendell Berry, a protest meeting on environmental abuse is not a convocation of accusers, it's a gathering of the guilty. Says Aldo Leopold, one of the founding leaders in the conservation movement. Every time I turn on an electric light, I'm selling out to the enemies of conservation. When I submit these thoughts to a printing press, I'm helping cut down the woods. When I go birding in my Ford, I am devastating an oil field. We're all embedded. And I'm starting to think that almost in any dilemma, repentance is rarely a bad first step. It's such a forward-looking word. Such a liberating word, a freeing word, that shifts the pronoun and invites us to dream. Hope requires the courage to reach further and the courage to dream dreams. What kind of future do we really want? Or maybe more correctly, placing ourselves into the minds of those awaiting the consequences of what we do, what kind of world might they want? Let me give you an example of hopeful vision. This is the land upon which the research center where I work was founded just over a century ago. That's how it looked in 1908, the superintendent's house, on a vast expanse of prairie which stretches unhindered to the distant horizon. Somebody thought it might be a nice idea to plant some trees. This is how it looked in 1908. In 1918, 1936, and how it looks today. Now we might debate whether that was a good idea to plant trees in the prairies, but there's no denying the potency of time, and the forcefulness of hopeful vision. So again, the question, what does a carbon neutral society look like? What do we want the world to look like and how do we make it so? What kind of alluring vision can we offer? Again, I don't know the answer to these questions, but I suspect that will have to be a communal venture based on collective creativity, using a, based on a new spirit, rooted in love of community, says Aaron Feld, and love of the land and nature that sustain community. There are those who say, probably justifiably, that such a new world will have high costs, or getting there will involve high costs, and likely involve sacrifices. cannot be arrived at without substantial pain. Maybe they're right. But suppose we envision a cycle, and instead of focusing on the carbon footprint, which is perhaps the symptom of the problem, can we attack that cycle elsewhere? Can we find ways of living hopefully for things that last, seeking meaning, seeking hope, as Havel defined it, thereby giving that cycle just an initial nudge. And that's not necessarily a new idea. 
said Schumacher, an economist. Strange to say, the Sermon on the Mount gives pretty precise instructions on how to construct an economics of survival. Seek first the things that last. And maybe that cycle gets a little nudge. Let me give you a completely frivolous example, merely to illustrate the point. Someday, select someone who desperately needs a dose of hope. And then set aside three hours and sit down and write that person a letter, not a text, not an email or a tweet or a Facebook missive, but an honest to goodness letter on paper with a pen. And imbue that letter with such eloquence and such poetry and such compassion and love and sensitivity that the recipient will take that letter weeping and store it away in some special box where someone 40 years from now will find it and your hope will re be resurrected for them again. Now you say, what does that have to do with carbon footprints? Only this. It's a tiny little reorientation of mind and spirit. Maybe only yours, if nothing else. And besides that, maybe your carbon footprint has shrunk just a smidgen while you were writing that letter. And so we can think of many other examples like that aiming for things that last, learning to play the violin, writing poetry on a park bench, repairing an old bicycle, making peace between two neighbors, and my favorite, planting an oak tree. Those are acorns of oak. In September, I put them into our refrigerator. And there, next to the butter, they sprouted. They're planted now. And Little treelets are emerging. Right now, they contain maybe a gram or two of carbon. But in my dreams, they're massive trees containing many tons of carbon collected over all these years from all of us, accruing to this great mass. And so they connect them to those times, those people waiting in the wings of time. And that connection works also the other way. Because those acorns and that little tree, by the good graces and kindness of the people at the Steinbach Museum, that little tree is the grandchild of the great Cortitza Oak. We're all connected. A small act of hope can ripple out to places and times far beyond us, emphasizing the importance of heroism of the trivial. We must dispel the myths of Lenton and Watson that local community activities are worthless. One last point, very briefly. It's not just a matter of dispensing hope, of having hope, but also of dispensing it. All around us, said one philosopher, we can see people trying to solve by the acquiring of information problems that can be dealt with only by a change of heart. Science alone will change few hearts. Information abounds, but information alone does not move most people. For that, we need the artist the novelists, the poets, the creative writers, the musicians, the visual artists, they will provide the inspiration, I think. Some time ago, someone dared to write in a scientific journal, I suggest we do not need better scientists and technicians, but better poets and prophets. I think he's onto something, because a poet has shortcuts to truth which are denied the plodding people of science. <clears throat> science has much to say 
and needs to be heated. But the human heart will be swayed not by cluttered graphs and tables full of data, but by the lilt of a song and the rhythm of rhyme and the potency of story. Who will sing us that song? Who will tell us those stories? It's down to the messenger, the story to make change possible. And I am more and more convinced that our legacy as communities will be not only cleaner air and greener lands and fresher water, but better stories and images planted in human minds. They are our footprint. No, Thoreau says, they are the mind prints that we leave everywhere. And so I'm back to where I start. Back to the soil, back to dirt, not only as a medium, but now as metaphor. A metaphor for something that lingers and lasts and always remembers, a means of connecting to something beyond us. And a metaphor for endless renewal that I have seen so often in my studies of soil carbon. For the soil is healer, restorer, resurrector. It is not only a burial ground, but a nursery. Not only a grave, but a womb. I'll leave you with one last image. A story of sorts. It's a story that keeps recurring to me. I don't know what it means exactly, but it seems somehow relevant. I see a feeble old man hunched on rumpled bed in some lonely institution. The old man looks an awful lot like me, but thinner, more wrinkled, and a little more sad. There's a knock at the door, and there enters a child, timid and shy, maybe from neighborhood church. With a meek little smile, she hands the old man a branch, a sprig of pussy willow. And the old man's heart leaps at distant memories. He places the little twiglets into a tall glass of water and watches day by day in lonely wonder as perfect shiny leaves appear and fragile rootlets emerge. Unable to restrain his joy one day, the old man calls up that child, and when she knocks at his door, he hands her the flourishing wonder. Will you plant this for us? He asks. Through his window, he watches as the earth is turned, the sproutling tenderly planted. And the old man, who looks so much like me, sits on his rumpled bed, weeping in wordless worship. For he sees he's been led by the hand of a child to the very edge of Eden. Thank you. <laughs>